Hi, welcome to Midwest Magic Cleaning. My name is Frankie Butt Boobs, and today we're going to be looking at a hoarder house that isn't really a hoarder house. So most of the time when you see a house this cluttered and it's on my channel, it's probably a hoarder house. This household does have some hoarding tendencies, but this is actually not what I would call true hoarding. This is actually a case of compulsive spending. Now we'll discuss the difference between hoarding and compulsive spending here in just a few, but I wanted to point a couple of things out real quick. First, know that I spent about 20 hours over two days just decluttering this house. There was almost no actual cleaning done. The house really was wasn't what I'd call dirty. My main focus here was getting the house decluttered, throw away a whole bunch of stuff, and then vacuum the floors and sweep the hard floors. She did hire us for bi-weekly cleaning, and when we go into this house next, that's where we'll actually take everything off the surfaces and do our whole Mr. Clean, Old English, APC, wipe downs and all that. This was just two solid days of hardcore decluttering. Another thing to note is I really need to start start bringing some lighting with me because damn I mean I've got lighting I could bring with me but like the thought of setting it up and lugging it around just makes my butt itch I don't know what that means but anyway we are getting rid of a lot of trash and by trash I don't mean what I encounter in most houses which is like rotten food a ton of drinks cigarette butts and medication everywhere mouse poop bugs like this house had none of that this is just stuff and the trash that I encountered was like shopping bags and open packages where the, the packages just hadn't been thrown in the trash. Now throwing things away is where we get into the difference between compulsive spending and hoarding. Hoarding is a neuropsychological disorder. There are two nodes in the brain. One controls emotional regulation and the other one controls big decision making. And in a hoarder, when you put them under a brain scan, those particular areas of the brain don't show nearly as much activity as a quote unquote normal person. I made little quotes in the air with my fingers when I said that just for a, a visual effect if you if you need that. So because of that kind of malfunction, hoarders tend to have an emotional attachment to objects and even making the decision on whether they should keep it or throw it away is like a system overload for them. To them, throwing away something that they've put an attachment onto, even if it's worthless garbage, is akin to throwing out their pet or a child. In compulsive spending, there's not really that desire to keep things. She likes to buy things, but she has no problem letting me get rid of what I need to get rid of. There's not really an emotional attachment to the objects themselves. It's the act of buying that brings her joy, and it's like a, a big dopamine hit every time she buys new stuff. Now because of that, you're going to see me throwing away a whole bunch of stuff in here that you're going to think, man, I wouldn't have thrown that away. Somebody could have use that. For instance, you'll see me throwing away like boxes of crayons. In reality, these kids have probably 50 plus boxes of crayons. A handful of ink pens would make somebody cringe to see those thrown away. They have hundreds upon hundreds of pens, maybe even thousands. Now the bulk of what they need to get rid of is stuff that she's getting ready to go through. In fact, she does have a dumpster in her driveway in preparation for sorting all this stuff out. When they start sorting clothing, the goal would be if they pick up 10 objects, 10 pieces of clothing, nine of those should go in the garbage. And even saying that, they would still likely have too much clothing in the house. She's been storing it away in tubs, all the clothes that they, they don't wear. But now she's getting into where she's like, okay, this is too much. I have to get rid of it. The kids have outgrown it. There's a bunch of stuff that I personally don't wear. And so she's getting ready to get rid of all this stuff in order to free up space. That's a really good step. They also have a problem with shoes. They have probably 10 times more shoes than I have, and I consider myself a, a shoe guy, meaning I'm made of shoes. I'm so, That's not what that means at all. I'm, I don't know why I said that. Anyway, they have enough shoes to fill a small dumpster on, on their own. They also overspend on crafting supplies and definitely on snacks. You'll see that whenever we get into cleaning the dining room and the kitchen. If she stopped buying snacks right now, she would have enough to last her through the rest of 
of the year and probably into next spring. And there's a lot, a, a whole lot of snacks. There also happens to be a large buildup of old homework. And that's something that I find in almost every cluttered house is kind of the inability to get rid of old homework because it feels like you're getting rid of a memory. And so it just stacks and stacks until somebody like me, someone cold and heartless and dead inside like me comes in and just throws it all away like it was nothing. Like I threw it away like I was angry at it. I took out probably two 40 gallon trash bags of just old homework alone. Also, you'll see a an old white printer on the bottom of a computer desk here in a second. She let me get rid of that too. And whenever I threw it in the dumpster, I gave it a little extra oomph just so I could see it shatter. Because printers are the devil. Printers are the only piece of technology I've ever seen that just stopped improving the year they were made. Like the year it was invented, that's as good as printers ever got. And yeah, they added color and they added a little bit more detail to how they print, but the functionality... I would consider printers to almost be a virus. Anyway, I, I won't ramble about my hatred of printers, though I do have a hatred of printers. They can suck it.
Now, even though I know that a lot of this clothing is going to be thrown away or donated, I still folded it all. And one of the reasons that I did that was just a matter of saving space. There's so much of it that if I don't fold the clothing, the piles end up being bigger than folded stacks. So it's a whole lot of extra time for me to do that, but it makes the place look so much better when I can stack it, get it in some drawers or in a tub and out of the way. Then when they go through it, a lot of those they'll be able to recognize on site. So instead of having to unfold it and look at the front, once you're used to your own clothing, you can usually just kind of flip through the bottoms of the folds of the shirts or whatever and just know which ones are which. So it should make sorting quite a bit better or at least easier. What you'll see me folding, all of this is clean, and you won't even see me folding all of the clothes in the house. There were still another, man, I don't even know, 10 tubs of just random clothes that still needed to be folded, sorted, and all that, and I just didn't have time to do it all. I did the bulk of it, but there's a, a large toy room downstairs that has several tubs. There's also a couple tubs in the hallway and several garbage bags that are full to the top. There's so much clothing that I would almost suggest to her to ditch it all and to take the kids on a new wardrobe shopping spree. I mean, it's not great for her to be shopping because she does have that compulsion, but she also does have the money to replace all this. And I don't know which would be worse, the mental overload of going through an entire dumpster worth of clothing or just starting from scratch and buying three new wardrobes. Had I stayed here and folded it all, which I considered doing, I would have been on this house for four days. I folded so much clothing that I almost accidentally folded my own like while I was wearing it. It was just an automatic response to grab a shirt and to go flip, 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 stack, flip, 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 stack. And I had to be careful because if I zone out and do that, I'd flip, 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 stack like twice and I'd look down and I'd just be butt naked. Fortunately, I was the only one in the house. So had that happened, I would have only grossed out myself.
When we get into the kitchen, you're going to notice right off the bat the massive amount of snacks on the center right. They have several containers that are just meant for little bags of chips, but there's also snacks in the freezer. There's snacks in the pantry. And whenever we get into the dining room, you're going to notice gigantic unopened boxes of more chips and more snacks by the dining room table. If I could only give her one piece of advice after this cleaning, I would say to put all spending on hold for at least a month to see how much that stuff goes down, not just on snacks, but on everything, clothing, food, drinks, art supplies and craft supplies, toys, just absolutely everything and let that stuff start to dwindle down on its own so that she can make a routine out of buying when necessary. There's no problem in overbuying as far as like being prepared, but I think that there's like a tipping point that she doesn't quite have a feel for. She just can't quite find that sweet spot that's right on being prepared versus way overdoing it. I think she's learning like I this is not the first time I've cleaned this house. She used to be a customer customer of ours in the past. And she's always had that problem with the spending compulsion, but it's actually not quite as bad as it used to be. So she may be getting outside help and trying to learn how to manage that money, or she may just be getting way more used to it than what she was. But yeah, it, it does need like a set of breaks.
Now, strangely, I actually relate to the compulsive spending problem on a personal level. I grew up really poor, like welfare poor. There were times in my life where we ate once a day. I was never taught how to use money as a tool. And even after I grew up and moved out of the house, I didn't earn an actual livable wage until I was in my probably early 30s. I didn't earn a respectable wage until I was in my late 30s. When you switch from being poor to being even middle class, you have a tendency to view money differently than if you grew up with it. If you grew up with it, you see it more of a, as like a tool and you learn how to manipulate it in order to make more of it. When I grew up poor, we were of the mentality that if you got money, you spent it as quickly as possible because otherwise it was just going to vanish anyway. So you didn't really worry about paying off a hospital bill because to, to us, that would have been just like throwing money away. We already owed the hospital anyway. It wasn't like they were going to put us in jail. Bankruptcy doesn't mean anything to somebody who's poor because we don't really own anything to begin with. So if you get a little bit of money, say from a tax return or whatever, that's when you buy your school clothes or you buy a a TV to replace the broken one, or you do some sort of splurging night out where you eat at a fancy restaurant or whatever. And to us, fancy restaurant was like Red Lobster. So whenever I got a, a really good living and I started making money, I went crazy with donating to charity and I went crazy with Christmas. So instead of budgeting out a certain dollar amount for Christmas, we would spend thousands of dollars on gifts. When we went out to eat, it wasn't uncommon for us to spend like say $60 on the meal and tip the server a hundred because we know how sucky that job is and we know how unappreciated those workers are. So my wife and I, having come from basically the same background, would be like, let's make her night. And we would just throw in an extra hundred dollars. We did that for a very long time. And the act of giving is the compulsion. It's not like we were getting off on buying stuff for ourselves. We were buying things for others. So I would have no problem spending like a thousand dollars on a bunch of Christmas presents for my kids, but it would drive me nuts to do that same thing for myself. The fun and the dopamine rush came from seeing the reaction of another person whenever they got something crazy nice. But I would wear my own pants until they had holes in them because I didn't want to waste the money. It's such an illogical way to think. I understand that. It's why it was a compulsion. But the giving aspect of it is what really drove me to do stuff like that. And I think that she is in the same situation. Almost everything in this whole house was bought for the kids. She just loved loves to shower them with gifts and it's hard to shut off that faucet once you've had it going full blast because then you're afraid the kids are going to be like, why are you denying me cool stuff? Like they'd feel neglected. That's how you think in your head when you're in that situation, even though logically we know that that's not the case. And also it feels so good to give gifts to people that we want to continue that feeling by continuing to give gifts. And so the spending just gets out of control. When we were doing cleaning for her before, she would overpay every single week to the point that it was almost uncomfortable because I knew she could afford it, but also I didn't personally need that extra money, but it also felt like an insult to turn it down. Like she's giving me a tip and I'm, I'm like shoving it back in her face. But then whenever it went from me cleaning her house to my employees cleaning her house, she would overpay and also tip them on top of that. So she was paying roughly twice what she needed to pay to have her house cleaned. So over the summer, she canceled the service because they were going to have some remodeling done and they went on basically like a summer long set of vacations and just got away from the house. The house became like a pit stop between vacations. Then once school started back up, that's when she rehired us. And this time I told her that we would do it on a biweekly basis. Then if she needed it more than that, then we would discuss that later. But I told both her and my employees that they're not allowed to give or accept tips, that she's to pay our minimum amount for the service and no more, no extra and no tips. I think without me doing that, 
she would have continued paying a quite frankly ridiculous amount to keep her house maintained. I just don't think that it's healthy to allow her to continue doing that with with us. Now, if she wants to tip me because I look like this, well, then I understand that part. When you look like I look and you're as fly, funky, dope, fresh as I am, you kind of have to charge for, for the looking. It's just morally irresponsible to not. That's why when I'm in the grocery store and somebody glances my direction, I'll just give them that nod as if to say, you're welcome. That'll be $5. A couple of important notes on the channel. Next weekend, I am going to Nashville, so there may or may not be a video next weekend. It just depends on if I have time to clean a place during the middle of the week, or while I'm down in Nashville, I may just run a live and chat with people for a while. But if you don't hear from me next weekend, it's because I have shut my phone off and am just enjoying the weekend with no cleaning products on my hand and no having to breakdance battle random children in the neighborhood for the sake of content because that's how i roll son call me breakdance battle johnny back in miami yo man is that old breakdance battle johnny i don't know let's turn on this 80s music and see what he does i bet he breakdances another big piece of news in the first week of october i am meeting with and collaborating with clean with barbie as well as a beautiful mess she's an up-and-coming cleaning channel that does what i do Maybe with less spin kicking, but pretty much the same. Also, Insider is planning on sending out a videographer to document what we're doing and interview us for a spot on their site. The house that we'll be cleaning is a six bedroom house and the owner has not been able to enter the basement in three years. We're expecting to have multiple dumpsters for that one. It should be a massive cleaning, but I'm just really happy to be able to collaborate with Barbie and a beautiful mess. It's going to be really awesome. And as long as I'm on news, we're edging up on a thousand members. If you've ever wondered how to show a little extra support for the channel, like financially, I have a members only section that I link in the description. It's $4.99 a month and you get an extra video every week. Most of the time, they're not like what you're seeing here. They're more kind of like vlog or just philosophical conversations while I'm doing something in the background. Sometimes it's cleaning, sometimes it's mowing my yard. The video isn't as important as the narration on the members only section. I have gone back and re-edited and narrated some of my older videos that don't have narration on them. Some of those older ones that just had music, I cut the music out entirely and put brand new narration over the top of those old videos. Videos, and I'll be continuing to post that in the members section until those are all re-narrated and updated. If you can't afford something like that, for the love of God, don't. It's just a little extra. I don't use Patreon and the member section is just my way to basically do what Patreon offers, but also give back to the community with some extra videos and some extra posts. Anyway, if you like that kind of thing, that's it's there. If you don't, well, you can suck it. You can suck it straight to hell. I'm so sorry. You did you don't you shouldn't suck it straight to hell. That was very rude of me.
Now, a couple things that I didn't do in here that I'm going to do later. I swept the floors, but I didn't mop them. Whenever I do mop them, I'm going to have to saturate that floor and just let it soak for a bit and probably take a paint scraper to it because it's got stickers and old candy and stains. I'm going to have to probably do that floor by hand in order to get all that stuff off. If you're wondering why there's so much stuff on the floor, it's because there is an autistic child in the house. There is also a child who has fetal alcohol syndrome. There is ADHD in the household. This is a case where the grandmother has custody of three grandkids and the kids are heavy into activities and sports and arts and crafts, but they all do a lot of stuff together as a family. And most of that stuff that they do is oftentimes outside of the house. So when they get back and they relax, the kids don't quite have the ability to pick up after themselves yet. They need a lot of training in order to bring that into their routine. And so they make a ton of messes. They're kids. The grandmother is so busy that basically she has a few minutes to herself after they go to bed before she just passes out <laughs> and then starts it all over again the next day. She does put out the effort, but they, I mean, they really do a lot. I'm not making excuses for them at all. There's Some of this can obviously be avoided, but it's going to take a lot of training and a lot of patience in order for the whole household to work together to keep it this way. And that's not going to happen overnight. But like we found out before, whenever I say we, and I, I mean that as like a company rather than just like me as a channel, but as my cleaning company found out before, once we get the house into a stable condition, we were cleaning it weekly back then. And each week it got a little easier and a little easier to the point to where I wasn't just just cleaning the house, I would actually do all their laundry too because I got so quick at, at cleaning the house and she was paying so much to have it done. So I guess the reason I'm telling you that is know that once we start doing this bi-weekly, we will get this back into a stable household again and then their will and their motivation and their ability to maintain it gets better every time we clean it. So if they need it once a week, we will do it once a week. But I have faith that this family will do just like they did the last time we cleaned for them and they'll get into that routine themselves. And if not, there's one easy way to teach them and that's to drop this sweet elbow from the top rope, baby. You get a couple of them and you have learned your lesson, son. You'll clean other people's houses just to avoid this elbow. You'll dirty your own house just to clean it. No, John Elbow, please don't drop on me from the top rope. I'm going to drop on you from the top rope with my sweet elbow. Here it comes. Woo! That's a sound of pain right there. A conversational exchange of pain is what you just witnessed.
So back to the compulsive spending issue real quick, because I know what's going to happen. I'm inevitably going to get a whole bunch of people who are like <laughs> stupid first world problems. I feel so bad for them. One, no one's asking you to feel bad for anyone. And two, and like it doesn't make it any less of a problem, whether it's a first world problem or not. She's not spending herself out of money. She's spending herself out of space. But in no universe am I asking for anybody's sympathy for her problems and neither is she. Nobody's asking for pity. We're just explaining why there's a problem with space and clutter in this house. If your reaction to hearing about somebody else's problem is to blow it off as not a problem or a problem that's not worthy of empathy, just a basic understanding of the way it functions, then in the most polite terms that I can muster, you are a douchebag. Other people's problems do not require your approval or a rating system or a ranking system. They don't need to be compared to other types of problems. Problems. They don't need to be classified as worthy or unworthy of empathy, but they do need to be understood so that they can be solved. Without understanding the way they function, you can't fix it. I try to have empathy for everyone if I can. I just have a really low tolerance for people who try to one-up somebody else's problems with their own, trying to kind of nullify and negate that. For a really great example of that, a funny example, look up the Bob Saget rehab scene from the movie Half-Baked. If you don't like cursing, then don't look it up, but you can find just that one scene. It's called Rehab and the movie's called Half-Baked. And it's Bob Saget really mad at somebody else claiming they have an addiction to a much lesser drug than the one he uses. And I know it's played for comedic effect and it is an extremely funny scene, but I've known people like that my whole life. <laughs> and so it kind of hit home on a different level for me because I'm I'm like, oh, that's every person I grew up with in the town that I no longer visit. Anyway, apologies if that sounded ranty or douchey myself. I'd just done this long enough to know what I'm going to hear from people. And I wanted to try to head that off at the pass or at least make an attempt. I'll still hear it from people.
members, I will see you on Wednesday and I may see everybody else next weekend. Again, it's just going to depend on if I get another house to clean between now and next Friday because Friday is when we're leaving and we won't be back until probably Monday morning some point. But if I can find that house to clean between here and there, I'll see you next weekend. And if not, you can just suck it. Later.